namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami It's good to be here. I feel yeah, very welcomed by Ajahn Nisabo and the community here. As a, yeah, as a monk, we're trained to notice the little things. And one thing that Ajahn Nisibo and I have only lived together for about, what, four or six months? How long was it? Something like that, he says. He, we can't remember. <laughs> Some months. But yet, when, when I come here, we know exactly, we're trained in the same lineage. I, we know exactly how our protocols work. So... Yeah, we both show up here. I've got my alms bowl. He's got his alms bowl. And, you know, we know such things as we, yeah, we need to receive the food. We should wash our alms bowl before putting it in. Um, you know, Ajahn Nisabo bows to me. We sit on these, you know, we sit on these sitting cloths. All of this is, and so it's just so smooth because the two of us know how to even though I've never been to this auditorium before, um, we know how we know how the protocols work, and yeah, it's really that's yeah, just just noticing that about the what it yeah how how being in a lineage works, you know, and training under, I mean, our both of our you know we're, this is the Ajahn Chah lineage, so that was the originator of it, and we're slightly different branches, but not a problem we cooperate yeah and so one of the other thing you noticed is that um what we use the same chanting so mangala sutta you know we both can we can both chant that from memory and yeah and so and i thought it was very another thing is we usually don't prepare talks ahead of time this was Ajahn Shah's usual recommendation. I was very happy to have the Mangala Sutta chanted because we've all heard that and it's something to talk about. <laughs> so, yeah, so Mangala means, um, well, it has in the, in the chanting in English, it's translated as blessing, but it equally well translates as protection. You could chant it that way if you wanted to. These are the highest, this is, this is the highest protection. And that, that sutta, especially in the Pali, has, has a rhythm with the, um, oh, it's, it's about 12 or 13 sections of four, four lines. The fourth line is always identical. Etang mangalamuttamang, you know, these are the highest blessings, or this is the highest protection. And it's arranged in, it's arranged very, um, yeah, it's arranged according to ascending levels of, um, of blessing and protection. So it begins with not associating with fools, which is probably the advice you probably try to give to your kids. Don't hang out with the wrong people. And if you do, and if you do that, even that much is quite a blessing. Um, you know, and then associating with the wise. Who we, who we spend time around really influences us. So that's why so many people come here, because you, you're choosing to spend time around people who are oriented towards goodness. And then, yeah, 
It's honoring those worthy of honor, just as Ajahn Nisibo explained, the sense of honoring, honoring this tradition, recognizing that there are, there are people who have done great things with their lives, and we can learn from them. And then, yeah, just it goes through a, a yeah, long series of blessings, and I'll just pick out some of them, but it is quite comprehensive. You know, it includes just what it, you know, making, making one's livelihood in a skillful way. Um, that's, a, that's a blessing if one, learns, if one learns how to do that. Um, also, yeah, taking care of our parents and relatives. You know, that those bonds of family. And again, the way the sutta describes it, um, these, it's, it isn't about you should do these things. It's the result of doing these things is beneficial for yourself and others. It's blessings and protection for both. And that's always the that's always the tone of the Buddha's teachings. They're phrased, the Buddha taught cause and effect. And if you, if you learn how to put skillful causes into your life and into the world, then the results will be skillful. It doesn't always happen immediately, especially if you've, got, if you've, if you've done unskillful things in the past, those will, the results will keep coming. But as one, as one puts effort into more, into shaping one's life in a more skillful way, those results manifest too. And so, Yeah, it also has a couple of verses on yeah, respectfulness and being of humble ways. Just yeah, rec not 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 making the center of one's life, trying to prop oneself up. Can, can we can actually you can uh, you can watch how frequently you know how frequently we do this, and it's it's important. <coughs> not to get too upset about it, otherwise we'll hide it from ourselves, perhaps. But just noticing, you know, if I, when you say something or when I say something, how much of the time am I trying to impress someone? Being aware of that, one can, one can experience, actually, one can experience, oh, yeah, there's some, there's tension there. I'm, I'm really hoping that if I say this, the other person will be impressed. You know, so I have my, you know, it's, you know, like when I, when I tell people what I did in the past, and I did it more as a lay person, but what I'd mention, I'd always watch, because I'd be, I'd be watching for them to, I'd be watching for their reaction. A lot of people were impressed, at least I hope, I, then that was my, you know, that was my sort of hope, and so when they weren't, I'd feel a bit deflated sometimes. So watching that, noticing how, yeah, and, when one reflects on it, one realizes, ah, oh, everyone, that's not very secure, wanting other people trying to, uh, wanting, making my well-being depend on whether other people approve of what I used to do or not, or whatever else it is we try to do to impress other people. Um, and so rather than saying, that's wrong, don't do it, the Buddha says, watch the suffering, it's painful. If you pay attention to that pain, you'll stop doing it. And this is a, this is a lot easier, you know, this, this is a step away from self-view, not trying to, I think there was a famous Puritan who tried to be, who was really proud of how humble he was. And one can get so tangled in that. And the Buddha's teachings are just a simple way out. But what shall we say it? 
I didn't realize, I didn't realize it until I encountered these teachings, how one could escape from these tangles of, um, of self-view, trying to, yeah, so for instance, I, I've always been very interested in security. So this, um, you know, these, these highest protections really appeal to me. Um, you know, those, those last two verses, I'll just skip there for the time being. Although in contact with the world, unshaken the mind remains, beyond all sorrow, spotless, secure. These are the highest blessings. They who live by following this path know victory wherever they go. Um, and for every place, and every place for them is safe. These are the highest blessings indeed. The Pali actually adds a word there, which they didn't translate into the chanting. The conclude. But those are... I mean, you know, though I'm really interested in that. And the way, so, but the way I sought for security for so long was by trying to become a, someone who was secure. I try, you know, try to figure out, okay, well, yeah, how can I be secure? And so I tried to figure out what I should be to be secure, and I never, and it was a trap. I couldn't find, because you can't find any, as a person, we're all very insecure. You know, we, um, yep. So for, you know, just a, a good, like a good friend and supporter of a Bayagiri monastery, I think about the week and a half ago, um, choked on some food and his son found him dead. You know, this is, this is the reality of human life. That could be any of us. And most of the time, we try to push that away. And our society very much encourages us to push that away and forget about that. It doesn't fit. You know, this Daniel, Daniel Fry was his name, was a very good person. Um, he was, yeah, we, we went to alms round to his house every week. Uh, and then he dies. So that's, hmm, that's not secure. <laughs> So, and again, but the Buddha suggests that look at, look at things straight on. Admit that. This body is not secure. Um, and then suggesting that there is a, there's a path of action that can lead one to security of, you know, um, although in contact with the world, one doesn't, it's not spacing out at all. Unshaken, the mind remains. Mm. Yeah, what? What's that? Beyond all sorrow, spotless, secure. And that's some of what we learn a bit about in meditation. It's like what we were doing uh, ten minutes ago, learning learning how to stabilize the mind, to make the mind, to give the mind a refuge apart from. Our, you know, th our proliferations about the past and the future. Uh, if you can, l learning that skill makes you, makes you more secure. Um, if, you're, if you're tempted to do something unskillful because it would be fun for a little while, one has it, one can realize, well, you know, I can just enjoy meditation. You know, one, one, one knows that and remembers it. I, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have time, so I didn't go into it, but when, when one is meditating skillfully, it's very helpful to, to, if one's enjoying the present moment in meditation, it's very helpful to spread that enjoyment throughout the body and really learn how that feels at a somatic level. Um, my understanding is that uh, research has shown that trauma, you know, sort of trauma both manifests in the body and sort of hides and lives there. So someone who's experienced trauma may not be able to feel every part of his or her body and as a result of that trauma. Uh, but my understanding is meditation does it, can do the same thing in a positive sense. You, you learn how to really inhabit this body and to be content there. So it's, it's actually a 
bit of a actually a bit of a strangeness in it. The body is both um, the body is both very obviously subject to death, but the Buddha said that yeah, mindfulness of the body is the path to the deathless. To go beyond death, we need to learn how to pay attention to this body in a skillful way. And yeah, and this the path, looking at more of the middle bits of the looking more at the middle bits of the Mangala Sutta. Yeah, it talks about um, yeah, discussing visit, visiting people who understand the Dhamma and discussing and discussing the teachings with them. It's really good to I hear you have question and answer sessions every time and that's that's a really that's a really skillful means of learning about these teachings and checking one's understanding. Um, yeah, learning, lear learning, because you can, you can read the suttas, and I, I've benefited immensely from learning to read, to read the suttas, but at the same time, it's not always, it's not always clear what that means in practice. So I have also probably benefited even more by being around um, teachers who, who really understand these, uh, who really understand, say, mindfulness of breathing at a deep level. Uh, my own, my own uh, primary teacher is uh, Lumpur Pasano, who teaches, who has practiced and taught mindfulness of breathing for decades now. And understanding, yeah, just spending time around him and listening to him answer my questions and answer other people's questions, seeing how he conducts himself, very inspiring and essential to if one wants to follow this path in a, to, a long, to, a large, to a long degree. If one's less committed, it's just fine to, um, you know, the, also the Buddha never, the, yeah, as I mentioned before, the Buddha never said, you should do all of this. It's just depending in, from his perspective, and he invites you to check him. Um, the more of this you do, the, you know, the more of this you do and the more attention you give it, the, the better the results will be. But again, it's to be, the Dhamma is, um, yeah, ehi pasiko, inviting one to come and see. It's not, we, we don't have to, uh, yeah, the relationship to faith in Buddhism is different than in some other traditions. Faith is considered useful, it's the first of the spiritual faculties, but it's not so much the faith that in the beginning, it's not the faith that I absolutely, I'm absolutely convinced that the Buddhist path is the absolute best thing in the world. The Buddha would say, you don't know that. <laughs> don't say, you know, you don't go, don't go beyond what you know. Instead, it's the, it's the, rec it's the, you know, you guys, okay. You know, like when I met, uh, you know, when I met Ajahn Amaro and Ajahn Pasano, I said, wow, I want to be like these people. What did they do? I'm interested, and I'm willing to put forth some effort to investigate. That's the kind of faith that this, that's helpful on this path. The faith that, well, this looks, this looks good enough to investigate, and I'm gonna put in, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it some time and effort, and see, see how it works. That's, yeah, that's, that's what's useful. I guess <clears throat> also, yeah, the, yeah, the importance of a community, spiritual friendship. I mean, it's, this is a lot of people here, actually. Um, 
the, yeah, it's not small what you've got here, and that's, that's really good. Um, you, you getting, you're understanding, yeah, the associate, associating with wise people is, uh, I mean, well, this you probably, at least three quarters, you've probably heard this teaching where Ananda, who is the Buddha's, Ananda was the Buddha's cousin and became his attendant for, I think it was, well, the last some, not a bit, third, I think it was a, for 20 years the Buddha had various attendants and then Ananda was his attendant, I think, for 35 years of his, um, of his teaching career. So Ananda was his kick and Ananda, Ananda is often a gusher and the Buddha usually corrects him. So Ananda one, one day starts gushing to the Buddha about how um, half of the holy, you know, that uh, spiritual friendship is half of the holy life. And instead of, and the Buddha corrects him, no, this is the whole of the holy life, Ananda, which may have not been what Ananda expected. But, and the way he put it was that, yeah, independence on a, independence on a spiritual friend, and his, you know, someone who understands the Dhamma, that's how you live the holy life. Without, in particular, without the Buddha, we wouldn't, um, without those, without, the Buddha having discovered this, uh, we wouldn't have it to practice. But it also, but it also refers to just you know, our more mundane forms of friendship, where you just spend time with people who share your values. That's a very big deal, and you can you can support each other, and that's something that's really missing in modern American culture. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I mean, my family is actually uncommon among white Americans in that um, my parents and my sister and my sister's family live in one house, and then my brother and his family live in another house four blocks away. So that's all of us within walking distance of each other. And so... Yeah, I, I only have to visit Seattle when I come to the United States to see all my family, and I can just walk between the houses as I want. And the kids, you know, they've got their siblings, and they've got their cousins, and they've got their grandparents, all, all right there. And my understanding is that's how it used to be. That was, you know, what, before, yeah, 200 years ago, that was totally normal. Now it's rare among white Americans. And even you know, and even uh, even British, I would say. So instead, we cultivate our intentional families, the people who share our values and yeah, share this auditorium. So yeah, learning to learn to use the opportunities that we have. So I think I will um, close the formal Dhamma talk there and open it up for questions and answers. And Ajahn Misabo, I have Yeah. Andamayam Dhammakataya Sadhu Karang Dharama Se Sadhu 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 Anumodami Thank you, Ajahn. It was really a pleasure to hear you speak on Dhamma again. Um, do we have two free-floating mic ability? Okay, great. We can use this one if we have to, and then Ajahn Kachana and I can share the, the wired mic. It's okay, we can use this one, Cheryl. So uh, people can feel free to um, raise your hand and just say your name and your question. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand or type something into the chat and same with YouTube live stream. 
And yeah, this is a very good opportunity to ask some questions, so please take it. Actually, I have a question. Um, could you talk about effort a little bit? When is effort too much, and when is effort just right? What, what, how would you describe the effort that you take when, when you're investigating something? Yeah. Yeah, so right effort is number six in the Eightfold Path. And the way that, the way that right effort is consistently described is the effort, the effort first, it's in, four, it's in four different parts. The first part is the effort to prevent unskillful states that haven't arisen from arising. The second part is to for unskillful is how to cause unskillful states that have arisen to go away. The third is how to cultivate is cultivating skillful states that have not yet arisen. And the fourth is how is called is the effort to bring the wholesome states that have arisen to development and fulfillment. And so in the Buddha's analysis of effort, it the way you determine how much effort to make is, and what kind, is what, what, are the, what are the outcomes? It's an iterative process. You learn, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's appropriate to work really hard because that's what's needed to, um, to, make the mind, you know, to make the mind peaceful or wholesome. Sometimes you really need to relax because you're, you're stressing yourself out and even though you think it might seem on paper that you're making a lot of effort, it's resulting in stress, and you need to relax, take a look at what you're doing, and you know, just reevaluate. And so it's, it's watching, watching the results and learning again and again how to, how to do that. What is a skillful state of mind? What is an unskillful state of mind? And the best indicator of that, one of the best indicators is the body. Instead of what we're thinking about, Instead of trying to mentally compare what we think is going on in our mind with what we think it should be going on in our mind, pay attention to the body. Is the body tense? Well, then if the body's, you know, tense and clenched, there's probably, you probably got some unskillful states in the mind. If the body is, you know, relaxed and, you know, bright, relaxed, ah, that, that's, the mind's doing well. See, does that answer your question? Very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sadhu. Thank you for um, uh, telling us that the word for blessing is always also protection. So I've been practicing for a lot of years, and when you, you're taught about the meta phrases, often the first one is, may I be safe from inner and outer harm. And for years, I struggled with that because like, where does safety come from? That was the question that was always coming up. And um, I um, have had little um, inklings that, um, it's w w the, a lot of what you were talking about, and I would appreciate you even talking more about this sense of protection and where you see um, that sense of safety and security coming from. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so one, again, that sense of safety and security comes yeah, it comes through our actions. And one, one very powerful form of security is just the confidence that you've acted in such a way that you don't have any regrets. Because that's, that's the thing, is that you think about, you know, Daniel Fry choking on his food. Um, you know, if that happens to you, I mean, what shall we say? Well, that's, you know, that's how it is. But if you can, but if you're confident that, yep, I'm, I'm happy with, you know, I, I'm, I've acted well over the past, you know, some number of years, that's, 
that's a protection, that's confidence. You can't, you can't know what's going to happen in the future, but if you've been acting skillfully in the past, you can know that, and you're probably seeing the results. So that, that, is, a, that is a protection. Um, that, yeah, that circumstances can't, can't take away from you. And also, yeah, th and there is protection also in having cultivated the mind. The mind learning, yeah, learning how to, learning how to make the mind less dependent on external circumstances and realizing that it, it can be done. It's not easy but it's possible. It can be very inspiring to, to hear stories about people who have done that to a significant degree because you realize, yeah, okay, it's possible. Let's see. And if I thought a bit, if I thought a bit more, I think I could, yeah, I think there's more, there's more to it, but it's not all coming to mind. There's also, um, the Buddha says there's five kinds of losses, and uh, it's relatives, wealth, health, right view, and morality. And he says of these five kinds of loss, the first three are trifling. Um, wealth, health, relatives, I mean, it will happen. Um, but the last two, your morality and your right view, those are, those are immense. And I think it just speaks to what Ajahn Kachan is saying. It's the ones we have control over. and. I think, yeah, there's a great deal to be said for those. It's great to have help. <laughs> okay. Someone online? Hello. Hello. Um, so you said that you used to want people to be impressed when you talk about uh, what you did before becoming a monk, so that now I'm interested in what you did before <laughs> becoming a monk. Fair enough. So you can, yeah, it's good. So yeah, I, I used to be a physics graduate student. So I, yeah, I, got a, I finished a PhD and then immediately went to the monastery. Um, the parallels Ajahn Kachana can draw between that realm and the Dhamma are really, really fun, so I'm just dropping that seed out there. Thank, oh, I have a quick question. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ajahn. Right here, yeah. Mike. Um, <clears throat> so this relates to something you said, and, and it also relates to the last question. So I've been hearing repeatedly that samadhi concentration stems from sila, stems from ethical living, and I can see how that flows in that we don't have regrets, therefore the mind becomes calm and, and one-pointed. But you also alluded to the fact that there's things that comma in the past from our actions before we found this way of life, the, this path, and that those can arise, and, and so that comma keeps coming around. How do we deal with feelings of regret or guilt or other motions that might disturb our mindfulness and our samadhi? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a, there's a sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya called the Conch, it's called the Conch Blower Sutta. I, should, I can't call the numbers. But there, the, again, the Buddha, men, the Buddha recommends his usual unflinching honesty. When, when, when one reflects on one's past behavior, you know, and in, in, this, in that particular sutta, the Buddha talks about it specifically in terms of killing living beings, um, stealing sexual misconduct, and telling lies. That, you know, so for instance, if you told lies in the past, you recognize, uh, yeah, well, I told, you know, I told some lies in the past. That was not good. The results of that are not good, and I recognize that. But if I were to get caught up in that, you know, get stuck, in, you know, in what I've done in the past, the results would be even worse. So instead, what I will do is I will resolve not to do that in the future, and then I will cultivate the boundless qualities, um, per, you know, the Brahma-viharas, 
pervading the quarters with, um, with loving kindness or goodwill, compa um, goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And in that way, one, and in that way, the effects of one's past bad actions are minimized to the extent they can be. Yeah. So I really appreciate the reflection on protection, and I feel that I have a lot of faith in the sense that my sila will carry me, my morality will carry me, but um, there are some teachings that I have a harder time accepting. Mm -hmm. And this morning we were discussing some of those that do tend to kind of challenge my faith, it seems like the teaching of the Buddha was like a cloth laid over uh, the format of the ancient Indian um, worldview. And sometimes it can be hard to bring that to the worldview that I've grown up with, the framework that I have. Um, and so we were kind of talking about our understanding of time this morning over coffee. And... Um, it, it's a bit confusing to me because I've been raised with this idea that the universe started and then has gone on and will someday end. But the Buddha talks about the expanding and contracting of the cosmos. And I'm just a bit confused on how I can kind of bring those two ideas together, or not, maybe not necessarily bring those two ideas together, but kind of see the science and the Buddhist perspective without forcing, uh, without forcing the, without putting words into the Buddha's mouth or, or mm -hmm. saying, oh, he definitely said this science was true. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, first off, yeah, the world, in the in the, yeah, the Buddhist cosmology has, definitely has worlds arising and ceasing. There's just more than one of them. So this particular, you know, so the idea is this particular universe did, you know, did have a beginning and it will have an end, but um, it's coexisting in parallel with a bunch of others, which are also beginning and ending. And there's, for all the Buddha could see, he couldn't see the beginning of all these world systems. You know, he could see lots of them, you know, so this is, that that's that's you know that that's my understanding of what's in the suttas, but yeah, I think it's very I think it's very useful just to um, to be clear that yeah, this is this is what's in the suttas, and then you know we have what um, we have what modern science is saying, and it's wow, it's I mean it's interesting. They're learning a lot. I you know I'm I'm behind since I've been 15 years in robes. I don't know what all they know now, <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, and just to let, I mean, you know, they don't, they don't seem to be, they, to me, they don't seem to be incompatible. You know, it's not, the Buddha definitely got the long time right. That, you know, if the, another, other people who said that, you know, the world is four or 5,000 years old, um, well, we're pretty sure the world is a lot older than that. And I mean, if anything, the, the Buddha over, you know, the Buddha's times are longer than the than the cosmologists times it's more than you know the buddha i mean the suttas saw longer than um the 15 or so billion years that that you know that the scientists say that our universe has existed so he overestimated i'm not sure but it's it's good to think about but it also you know it's not also it's not it's not that relevant to how we're practicing right now but it's good, it's good to have the big picture in mind, too. Does that answer your question or respond to it? Uh, John. Yeah. Um, Dad. I, um, the backstory is always very interesting. Um, and, and I certainly won't say anything embarrassing with a microphone on my uh, here. Um, but going back to the uh, highest blessings, certainly it is a 
um, a teaching in making good decisions. And um, that really resonates, I think, with most of us that um, sometimes we don't make great decisions. I thought maybe you could talk about your own decisions at the time that you were thinking about what to do for a career, because I, watching that as a father was, I was quite impressed. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Um, so just I'll give a little bit of background. I went to Harvey Mudd College for my undergraduate education and loved it. It was so much fun. Uh, and, you know, I, I chose physics. I guess I chose physics because I was interested in a fundamental science. I wanted to learn something, you know, something that applied to the real world as opposed to computers, which I was very good at, but I realized, hmm, I want to learn about the real world. So that was physics, and I really enjoyed physics. And because I enjoyed physics, I applied to physics graduate school, and I realize now that I thought that physics graduate school would be like my physics undergraduate school, and I thought wrong. I should have checked. I didn't, my mistake. So I was also very interested in doing something that was useful for the world. And so, and I, so I tried to find an advisor who was doing that. And turned, I, my first try wasn't, or at least I didn't, you know, the, he might have been doing something good for the world, maybe, but he wasn't so good at supervising graduate students. So my, the, the department really helped me out. And um, I got, I, my second graduate advisor was excellent. Um, so it's part why I finished, but I just became, I remember the department every year, the Berkeley physics department is very venerable, which means they're old and it means some of them are dying. And so every year we would have, <laughs> every year we would have the department address where they would talk about all the wonderful things that Berkeley physics department was doing. And at some point we would always have this moment of silence for the dead professors who, you know, who had died in the last year. And it seemed very disconnected because none of the physics we were doing had anything to do with the death that these ex professors were experiencing. And, you know, you just, it's a kind of awkward moment of silence. And I said, hmm, okay, I'm, I think I might, yeah, I, I, so I, okay, I think I want to investigate that death thing. And, I, you know, I was, and I was practicing Buddhism as a layperson rather ardently at the time. And so, yeah, I remember. I found a book called The Pathfinder, which is a career choice manual. It really helped me out. It kicked me into doing the research I should have done for my undergraduate work. And by the time I'd gotten through with it, the only sort of inspiring thing left was becoming a Buddhist monk. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was my, so that was, and Abayagiri Monastery was, you know, just, two and a half hour drive north from Berkeley and you know the abbots were Lumpur Pasano and Ajahn Amaro who I've already mentioned how inspiring I found them so it's like in you know I really respected my graduate student advisor he was he was far better than average at supervising students and he yeah really really good person but then you know so I respected my undergrad my graduate advisor but I wanted to be Ajahn Pasano <laughs> Um, we actually have to wrap things up about now. Um, quickly, Carl, uh, what was Ajahn Kachana's entrance into meditation again? Was it, uh, I remember it was when he was like 15 or something, beginning? Good, okay, just a little embarrassment, but not too much. <laughs> um, I know we have, is it uh, eight till right now, 52, 9.52? Hmm, I think we have to wrap things up. Um, I'm gonna end with a question though, uh, because I'm here with the mic. Um, Ajahn, would you, one of the best, most interesting parallels between physics and Buddhism I've ever heard you speak to was the tetralemma and the nature of light. Would you mind uh, just, you know? <laughs> In less than two minutes? My golly. Okay. 
So, so one of the, there is a, apparently at the time of the Buddha, there was this sort of questionnaire that um, wanderer, wand, ascetic wanderers would ask each other. And so it's just like you, you check out each other's opinions and you figure out where you agree and you disagree and you debate. And one of them was, is does an enlightened person exist after death, not exist after death, both exist after death and not exist after death, or neither exist after death nor not exist after death. And pretty, my understanding is pretty much all the ascetics would take one of these positions. And, but when, whenever the Buddha was asked these, he would say, all four don't apply, <laughs> which is even more complicated, you know, which is even more mind-blowing than neither existing nor not existing. And so, but modern physics has things that are similar. Um, if you, in particular experiments, and I won't go into them now, I can talk about them in person if people want, um, you, can have, you can have a photon or, you know, or an electron or a whole atom um, take two different, you know, it could go through the experiment one way or it could go through the experiment the other way. That's how you would usually consider it. You know, it takes this path A half the time, path B half the time, and you can't predict in advance. Well, you can experimentally demonstrate that it's inconsistent to, if you, if you insist that it must either do one or the other, well, you can show that both of those don't work, and the particle certainly gets through the experiment, but you can also show that it doesn't go through both paths either. So you have the tetra, so does not apply seems to be the best response to which direction does the particle go. And what's interesting, in both cases, the mistake is, the mistake in about the Tathagata is assuming that, you know, about an enlightened being is assuming that they exist, you know, assuming that they exist in the first place. You know, that basically, from their perspective, anything whereby you could say, you know, that is the Tathagata, the Tathagata, an enlightened being, you know, has, you know, relinquished, made like a palm stump, no longer subject to growth. It basically, I don't identify with that. If you want to call it me, well, that's your problem. <laughs> Similarly, what should we say? Uh, our assumptions about atoms are, you know, if, we, if you assume that something like a photon or an electron is like a big object, well, that's your problem. <laughs> you made the wrong assumption. The world works like it does, but we, we, we humans are clumsy and don't, you know, what? Just nothing in our world works like that. I think that uh, analogy is especially uh, wonderful because when the Buddha spoke about the enlightened mind, he spoke about light that lands on nothing. It's one of the few really clear analogies he gave. And um, someone was asking about time today. And um, I've heard one famous teacher say that time is the difference between the distance between craving and its satisfaction. And a very interesting thing about light is that um, it's the one thing that does not experience time. Um, you know, all like matter moves through space time at the speed of light. And because light is moving at the speed of light, it doesn't move through time. And I always just found those resonances with the idea of an enlightened being um, really moving. So um, thank you, Ajahn. I'm sure I got some of that wrong uh, from an <laughs> undergraduate physics professor point of, <laughs> point of view. Um, but We'll move on. Um, so uh, we can read the blessing braid uh, now and just to hold in our minds and hearts those who are uh, in need. So Seth and Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> 